It must have been mixed emotions when you saw your son for the first time in over 200 days yesterday. Definitely. I mean, it was overwhelming and emotional and it's hard to describe. I mean, I wasn't even really listening to what he was saying. I was just hearing his voice. I haven't heard his voice in six months. Um, I haven't seen him move. I've seen photos that we look at. Um, and it was, you know, it was also obviously very disturbing to see him. He's clearly medically compromised and medically fragile and seeing his arm. Uh, Hirsch and I are both left-handed. Now he's not left-handed anymore. And um, it was uh, truly just an overwhelming moment. Mm. And you looked straight in the camera yesterday. It was a very powerful moment as a mother where you almost ordered him to survive. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that's, I've been saying that mantra from the beginning. And, you know, I go for walks um, early in the morning and I say it out loud as I'm walking. I just, it's like I'm a crazy person. I just say it on repeat. I love you, stay strong, survive. I love you, stay strong, survive. I love you. And it is ordering him. It is ordering him. And I don't know how the universe works and I don't know if he hears it or if he feels it or if he knows it, but I am ordering him to survive. But also proof of life. Right. After 200 days, proof of life. Yes, huge. And, you know, it's interesting because we got thousands of people writing to us within one or two minutes after it went out. And people, it was such an interesting mix. Half of the people were saying, oh my gosh, congratulations. This is so wonderful. You know, I'm, and I'm thinking, you know, he is still actually held hostage, but, but I get where they were coming from because so many people were so emotional because they really have not thought he was alive. Mm -hmm. And I think as a mother and also what we had been told from intelligence is that people who they know that their loved one, the hostage, um, of a family where they know that that loved one is no longer alive, they do contact them. Or if there's a doubt, if there's some sort of suspicion that maybe they're not alive. And when you hear nothing, that's good news. So every day that we would hear nothing, we kept saying, okay, God willing, we are hopeful, we are praying, we are optimistic that he's alive. As parents, I think that that's you know, where you go. But I think a lot of people were, I mean, even a very close family member of mine said, I've just been sort of entertaining you as you've been saying, you know, we're going to save him. But they never believed that he had survived the seventh. But you have not given up. No. You have kept hope alive. Yes. I've said for 202 days, hope is mandatory, period. It's not an option, it's not a choice, it's mandatory. Or else it's, it would be impossible to function. I have a daughter the same age as your son, and you know, I think of a 23-year-old, they're an adult, but they're also not. How did it feel as a mother looking at your child with an amputated arm? Oh. It felt like he was four. It felt like he was you know, this is my little boy, and he has suffered horrible emotional, psychological, physical trauma that continues. And um, it's a horrible, uh, agonizing, miserable feeling. And on the other hand, He's talking, he's moving, he's alive, he's breathing, and he's saying, you know, uh, you know, at the end, he starts to talk directly to us. That must have been beautiful. Well, you know, I don't know who wrote it. I don't know if, you know, I don't know how these things work. I've never been in a situation like this. 
But as a mother, again, when you just want to take any hope and optimism, and it sounded like something he would say, um, and even if it wasn't his words, he was saying them, and I derive power from that. How did he look to you? I mean, apart of, from the obvious injury. Right. I mean, as a mother, you know, we look at our children exactly. and we, so right away, both John and I said, something's off because he looks swollen. Hirsch has always, always wanted to gain weight. He's 5'10 and he's 145 pounds. So it's very thin for his frame. Um, and we noticed right away that he looked swollen, which um, people, you know, in the intelligence community, they have doctors who said, you know, that could be due to diet issues. It could be edema that, you know, something else is going on. And it could be that he's on some sort of medication for something and it's a medication that's causing swelling. Um, but that, you know, certainly I noticed, obviously he's pale. I mean, he hasn't been out side in six months, but, um, you know, so we just felt he didn't look like the Hirsch that we know, he, and I think that's to be expected. Sure. Um, it must have been a very difficult Passover. Oh, Seder was brutal. Brutal. Thank God we were with um, our dearest friends and our close uh, cousins, um, and there were a lot of tears. So it was brutal but beautiful because we sat there, what is normally a celebration of freedom, we turned it into a crying out for freedom. Um, but there were just moments where I, you know, I couldn't hold it in or others couldn't hold it in and there was a lot of crying. And I think that that was the right Seder. It was the authentic thing to be doing, was to be crying, crying out and begging for freedom. So what is your demand then? You, you want your son home? Oh, I mean, I think that the five parties who are involved with these negotiations, they're all very smart people they can look around this entire region and see the horrendous suffering that is happening. Obviously, I'm the mother of a hostage. I look at my son, my only son, the person who turned me from a person into a mother. He's my eldest. And so I existentially changed when Hirsch was born into a mother and changed my identity. Um, I think that everyone has to decide to care about their people and love their people more than they hate their enemies. Because it's six months, there is so much tragedy and so much suffering. Hundreds of thousands of innocent people in Gaza are suffering. And, you know, of these innocent civilians who are in Gaza suffering, I know one of them really well, and his name is Hirsch, and I want him home. And I think that other people, all of these people with a lot of power and influence, can get it done. It will be hard, it will be a steep, difficult compromise, because that's what compromise is. Compromise is saying, I am going to give up something dear for something I hold even more precious. And that's not easy, and it requires courage, and it requires bravery, and it requires creativity, and it requires loving and caring about your people more than you hate the other. And I would beg and beseech at this point that we do that, all of us. And when I say we, everyone, and not just those five parties, not just Egypt, Qatar, Hamas, the U.S., and Israel. But if you're a human being, you know, people don't realize that of the remaining 133 hostages, they are from 25 different nations. There are Christians, Jews, Muslims, Buddhists, and Hindus. The age range is 86 years. There is a baby there. 
There's an 86-year-old grandfather there. It is enough. Let's be human. Let's figure it out. And let's end this. Enough with the posturing. Enough with the politicking. I know everyone has different interests, and interests are very tangled. There's a tangled web of interests. Enough. Be humans and get these 133 cherished souls back to their families, period. What gives you the courage to keep going on? You seem to have this incredible inner strength. I'm sure it doesn't feel like that all the time. <laughs> it's all fake. <laughs> um, it's a good fake. It's a total fake. Um, I think a lot of it, and you can appreciate this as a mother or if someone's not a parent, they just could picture their own parent, this is a very primal, innate, natural response when anyone in the animal kingdom feels that their child is in danger, you know, or their loved one is in danger. And it's reflexive. You know, I wake up every morning, John wakes up every morning, and we go. Yeah. And we, you know, our friend Ruby Chen, who also has a son who is being held tragically, he is confirmed no longer alive. He says every day we sprint a marathon. And that's what we do. We run to the end of the earth. We talk to anyone who will talk to us. We turn over every stone. We have no idea who is going to be the key that unlocks this. And so we have to keep going. We just have to keep do doing it. There's no choice. Tell us about Hirsch. Um, so that's always, you know, everyone's favorite topic are their children, uh, is their children. Um, Hirsch is a laid back, happy go lucky, easy going guy. Uh, he has a dry, dark sense of humor that is sarcastic without being mean, which is actually challenging. It's hard to be sarcastic without being mean. He's wild about soccer. He's so passionate about travel and geography. Um, He's a real citizen of the world. He loves to find out about new places and new things. He's a voracious reader. He's been obsessed with maps, atlases, globes, National Geographic since he's a little boy. Um, and, uh, and he loves music and music festivals. And that, this past uh, summer, he went for nine weeks by himself to Europe to six different countries, to six different music festivals. He met people from all over the world who have been in touch with us since this tragedy. And um, he said it was the most incredible experience of his life and he just loved asking questions and he leaves room for you to really answer. He'd be a good interviewer because he really, he asks very good questions and he has a very little ego. So he really wants to hear what you have to say. I look forward to that day. <laughs> and I look forward to the day that we're sitting chatting because Hirsch is home. Amen. Let it be day 202 and I could get rid of this tape and be done. <laughs>